Welcome to Clinical Medicine 2. In this particular presentation, we'll discuss hip disorders. In our previous discussions, we discussed hip osteoarthritis and total hip arthroplasty, and we'll follow on with several different disorders and their management strategies in this particular presentation. I just want to begin by thanking Dr. Greg Ford, who was instrumental in developing this particular presentation. At the end of this presentation, the learner should be able to describe the clinical presentation, diagnostic workup, and evidence-based management strategies for individuals with various hip pathologies, and formulate and implement a physical therapy plan for a patient with a hip disorder using the treatment-based classification scheme presented. In lecture three, we, we discussed uh, hip osteoarthritis and then uh, total hip arthroplasty to some extent. In this particular talk, we'll discuss the remainder of the pathologies on this particular slide. And in some cases, we'll talk about the diagnostic workup of them, some of the clinical presentation factors that are important, and then, of course, the evidence-based management associated with that. And you've discussed rehabilitation principles last semester as well as this semester, and it's just important to review some key principles again. And so this is the University of Virginia and Baylor model for intervention and progression. And this particular slide shows that following injury, this stepwise approach to rehabilitation. And I think what's important there most is if, if you're dealing with pain, um, that has to be appropriately managed. And then once pain is under control, you can begin to work on things like motion and motor control and strength. I think that you can certainly do some of that concurrently. Um, if you're dealing with individuals who are having pain, you can use modalities, you can use rest, you can use assistive devices to offload uh, the particular body part you're concerned about, and you can certainly engage in motion control exercises as well as some, you know, some basic strengthening or, or just some submaximal isometrics just to ensure that strength is maintained. But the key point is, is that we want to make sure motion and strength are present before we move on to higher level activities. As well, in the bottom right-hand corner there, tissue healing is going to play a huge factor in our rehabilitation plan. We're also going to think about functional abilities, patient goals, and then patient behaviors in terms of coping, compliance, etc. Also think about patient comorbidities. We've mentioned depression previously. Depression is a major comorbidity that influences many patients following surgery, and it's one that we're going to want to make sure that if we're dealing with individuals who have depression, that that's being appropriately managed. Also, the umbrella that you see in the middle of the screen, that really comes down to what the responsibilities are for us as a provider as well as the patient. And it's important to make those up front, especially for post-surgical cases where motion, strength, and really post-operative rehab is going to be key for their recovery. For many of the pathologies that we're going to describe in this particular presentation, we're going to discuss some general rehabilitation principles, but we're going to refer back to our HIP treatment-based classification scheme a fair amount. And so the keys here are that whatever pathology you're evaluating, we want to determine from a prioritization perspective what's most important. Are we dealing with range of motion concerns? Are we dealing with strength and potentially neuromuscular re-education concerns? Or are we dealing with some core uh, weakness and potential mobility issues as well? And so as we're thinking about each of the pathologies present here, um, these underlying principles of stretching and flexibility and strengthening and neuromuscular education are going to play a key role in how we're going to design our, our, our interventions for these particular patients. And so as we're going through the pathologies again, think about where these folks would potentially fit in our classification scheme. And again, uh, spend some time reading those uh, Rob Roy Martin papers. Uh, those are our two primary readings uh, for this particular uh, uh, section on the hip. And so there's good information in there as well with respect to how to uh, diagnose these folks and then progress them uh, with respect to rehab. Just like any other area, when we describe individuals with hip pain, 
we're still going to use these different phases of tissue healing. And when we're dealing with individuals in the acute phase, it's going to be important to think about techniques that we can use to minimize pain and inflammation. And so we can use modalities, we can use relative rest, we can use assistive devices to offload that particular area. We can use grade one and two joint mobilizations as well as some gentle passive range of motion exercises and to maintain some integrity of the musculotendinous unit, submaximal isometric exercises through the range, as well as beginning to work on lumbopelvic stabili stabilization exercises to ensure that we don't lose core or trunk strength. Those are all going to be important components of this early phase of acute rehabilitation. With respect to the subacute phase here, we're not going to be dealing with as much pain dominance as we are with restrictions in range of motion and strength. And so here we can use manual therapy, flexibility and range of motion exercises to begin to increase mobility. With respect to our manual therapy here, we can increase to grades three and four, because again, we're not dealing with folks who are pain dominant. We can work into tissue resistance and begin to address some of those accessory joint mobility issues. Also here, we can move from isometrics throughout the range to concentric exercises, including some closed chain weight bearing exercises to begin to load the joint. Again, in that case of weight bearing, we can begin to work on some balance and stability activities. And of course, we can continue with our lumbopelvic stabilization activities as well. And as the patient's disorders in that more chronic phase, as our rehabilitation begins to progress, now we wanna make sure that we're thinking about return to sport. And so if there's any existing lower extremity biomechanical concerns that we see, we wanna make sure those are addressed in terms of potentially flexibility deficits as well as muscle imbalances. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the next lecture. We're certainly gonna to wanna to continue with manual therapy as necessary. Grades threes and fours are likely gonna be indicated at this point to address any existing uh, limitations in joint mobility. And then finally, we can begin to load the musculature in an eccentric fashion a little more aggressively as we prepare the individuals for sport-specific training to get back to full activity. In this particular presentation, we will speak about post-surgical cases and patients who've undergone surgery for various pathologies, including things like hip fractures, avascular necrosis, as well as slip capital femoral epiphysis. And just like in the uh, last presentation when we discussed total hip arthroplasty, there will be uh, some precautions that go along with surgery. And so we're always going to want to make sure that, at least for this particular talk, where the, uh, where the precautions aren't necessarily as clear. They may be surgeon dependent and certainly patient dependent and uh, surgery dependent as well. Um, but the bottom line here is that you want to have open lines of communication with the surgeon. If there are protocols available, like in the case of a, uh, a labral tear, um, we're going to want to make sure that we have those. Um, we want to make sure we have open lines of communication, especially with respect to weight bearing, um, because weight bearing and precautions are going to vary. Um, a word about manual therapy. We've talked about that a fair amount already in the course. We've talked about it with respect to different stages of healing. Uh, manual therapy is not going to play as large a role with our post-surgical patients. We didn't really discuss it that much at all with, with regard to total hip arthroplasty. And some of the techniques that we, we would employ with a patient with hip OA are just not indicated um, because of concern over surgical hardware placement. And so manual therapy doesn't play as large of a role, but we're still going to use things like range of motion, strengthening exercises, and we're going to follow those basic phases of rehabilitation like we spoke about before. But I'd be real cautious when implementing manual therapy with post-surgical patients um, because, like I said, of concern over uh, post-surgical hardware and, and concerns with any, um, any uh, uh, concern with that. Um, we don't want to certainly interfere with any of the healing that's occurring with some of the forces we're placing through the hip. Let's take a moment and discuss congenital coxa vera, coxa valga. And this relates to the angle of inclination at the proximal femur. 
um, specifically the angle between the femoral neck and the femoral shaft. And when we look at coxa valga, we look at that angle of inclination as being increased beyond what we would normally expect. And then coxa vera, that angle of inclination is going to be decreased. The graphic in the bottom right hand corner give you some indication as what's actually going on with respect to a leg length, possible leg length discrepancy associated with these disorders. And so when we're dealing with coxa valga, which, which is uh, an increase in that angle of inclination, in order to maximize surface contact of the femoral head with the acetabulum, we're going to see potentially a longer limb. And you can see the position of the femur in that graphic in the bottom right with respect to coxa valga. And then with respect to coxa vera, where the angle of inclination is going to be decreased, once again, to maximize surface contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum, we're going to see the, the femur position in such a way that that limb may appear to be short. And so we're dealing potentially with a leg length discrepancy here and some of the concerns that may be associated with that. So these are individuals who are likely going to come in the clinic, you know, for some other reason. Um, they could potentially have low back pain, uh, sacroiliac disorders, they could have trochanteric bursitis, they could have a variety of different complaints of pain around the hip, but you may not know that there's a change in that angle of inclination unless there's radiography that's been done. But nonetheless, we're going to see this individual for likely some other complaint, um, and we're going to go ahead and evaluate them. And I think the beauty of our treatment-based classification scheme, again, is that you're going to go ahead and you're going to do your examination, and you're going to determine, am I dealing with concerns over range of motion? Am I dealing with concerns over strength? or is it a combination of both, and how would I go ahead and address that? It is important to talk about leg length, though. Um, with respect to leg lengths, we're going to likely want to equalize those. And so we've talked about measuring leg lengths before um, in, in, in one of our previous lectures. This will be important to do that here as well, to look at that. And, and again, if, if, if necessary, we may need to add an insert uh, to the shoe uh, to, to hopefully normalize some of the leg length discrepancies that we see. Uh, certainly orthotics can be helpful as well. But with respect to coxa valga, where that leg is going to appear long, some of the compensations we may see are on that ipsilateral side, we may see subtalar joint pronation. And we also may see ipsilateral lateral genuary curvatum during gait. On the contralateral side, we may see subtalar joint supination. We may see contralateral ankle plantar flexion, especially during gait. And we may also see contralateral uh, anterior nominant rotation, where the pelvis on the opposite side actually rotates anteriorly a bit uh, to make up for some of that leg length discrepancy on that side. So with an anterior rotated nominant, <coughs> you're going to see that limb appear to be uh, potentially longer with that. So that's a compensation we'll see. With respect to coxa vera, um, we're going to see a short limb on that ipsilateral side, and so we may see uh, subtalar joint pronation in that particular case, as well as um, on the contralateral side, we'll see subtalar joint pronation there. Uh, we'll also see ipsilateral uh, ankle plantar flexion to compensate again for that leg length discrepancy, and we'll see on the opposite side genu recurvatum. Um, we will potentially see a posterior nominant rotation on the contralateral side, um, and that's going to be in an effort once again to, to apparently shorten, uh, shorten that limb on that contralateral side. And so coxivarum, again, that limb's going to appear short. We're going to see ipsilateral subtalar joint pronation, ipsilateral length of plantar ankle plantar flexion to compensate for that. And the contralateral side, we're going to see subtalar joint pronation, contralateral genu recurvatum. We may see contralateral posterior nominant rotation in an effort to shorten that contralateral side. And so with respect to our management, um, again, we're going to look at muscle imbalances. We're going to talk about this a fair amount um, as, we, as we move along here. But this is a frontal plane uh, variant, a frontal plane variant with respect to anatomy. And so the gluteus medius is going to be affected here as well as the TFL. And so we're going to want to address not only the strength of those structures, but if the length is affected, we want to make sure we address that as well. And then orthotics is going to play a key 
um, as well with this. Um, sometimes orthotics and adding a heel lift to hopefully normalize some of those leg length discrepancies may be important. With respect to high impact activity, that's why we may be seeing the individual, right? So they have a little abnormal anatomy, they have a bit of a leg length discrepancy, now they're going, and it doesn't necessarily impact their daily function. However, when they go out and they stress the hip through activity, uh, higher level activity, now they begin to develop symptoms. And so the question comes up, do we allow these folks to get back to high impact sports with these type of um, with these type of anatomical uh, variants. And, and you'll read uh, different takes on this. And so high impact sports maybe aren't recommended. Uh, getting individuals in some of those lower impact sports that we spoke about uh, with respect to total hip arthroplasty, but certainly you can try uh, getting them back to it. But sometimes with some of these discrepancies that we see, um, it's difficult to get these folks back to high level sport. So while the angle of inclination of the femoral neck is a frontal plane concern, femoral antiversion and retroversion, as we've spoken about previously, is a transverse plane concern. And so a retroverted hip, again, to review, means that femoral neck is rotated posteriorly in the transverse plane. While an antiverted hip, we see an increase uh, or, or it's rotated forward. That femoral neck is rotated forward um, with respect to the transverse plane. And we talked about these compensations with respect to gait. And so if we're dealing with somebody who has a retroverted hip, Hip, we're going to see a towing out. If we have an antiverted hip, we're likely going to see a towing in. And so just review those basic principles of femoral antiversion and retroversion, and then we'll go ahead and we'll talk about some of the implications of this with respect to rehabilitation. We mentioned that femoral antiversion will lead to compensatory in towing during gait. And with respect to children, uh, femoral antiversion as well as internal and medial tibial torsion are some of the most common causes of individuals, younger individuals, having an in-toed gait. Um, again, we sometimes see this in kids age 3 to 10. Femoral antiversion, individuals are born with about 40 degrees and it decreases to about 10 to 15 degrees in adolescence. It's more common in, in, in young girls than, than boys. And if we don't see that angle diminish, um, we can try things like custom shoes, orthotics, and braces, but they're really not effective. And so what usually happens um, after the individual is eight or nine years old, uh, maybe when they're 10 or 11 or 12, if we're dealing with antiversion of more than 45 degrees, and on a clinical exam, we don't see any external rotation at all, um, these folks undergo a, a derotational femoral osteotomy to try and restore some of that normal anatomy. And the, the whole concern here really is, are we dealing with disability or are we dealing with the concern over that in-towing gait that we see so much of? And one of the concerns with respect to development um, was how kids have been sitting in the past. And so generations earlier than you guys used to sit when they were little kids in this W sitting position. And we'll show you that in a minute. And I think now uh, we've transitioned kids into more of this Taylor sitting position. But so many of these kids were in these W sitting positions when they were growing up. It was forcing that hip into an antiverted position and it was causing long-term problems. Um, let's take a look at those positions though. So again, W sitting or Taylor sitting, what's, what's better? We think that that Taylor sitting position on the right is much better for the developmental postures of the hip. If you look at those W sitting positions in this particular slide, you can see the degree of internal rotation that's placing on the hip, as well as forcing that hip, the proximal hip into this antiverted position. And you can see on the left, the young girl who's sitting in that W sitting position, when we lay her prone and we assess her internal rotation, you can see she almost has 90 degrees of internal rotation with respect to both hips. And we don't know how much external rotation she has, but that's a lot of internal rotation. And there's serious concerns there with how that hip is going to be uh, positioned and, and how that hip is going to function as she continues to develop. So bottom line is uh, Taylor sitting is recommended and W sitting is really, really frowned upon these days because of the forces that it places on the hip.
Like most cases, these are individuals who we're going to see who come to us for really some other problem. Uh, they're going to either have some other complaint around their hip, whether it be musculotendinous structures or potentially a bursal structure, or maybe even some labral pathology, and we're going to see concerns of antiversion, retroversion, kind of compounding the issues here. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that we address these acute symptoms. So we've, we've heard this story before, but we're going to want to ensure that we deal with pain and inflammation. That can be through some modalities. That can be through the use of things like ice. Uh, we, if we need to, we could potentially offload the individual if need be. Um, and we can also ensure that we're having the individual avoid these aggravating activities. We've put a case on the website for you of a young college age woman who was having some concerns with hip and back pain, and it really was related to excessive antiversion at the hip. And so part of that case, I think, really helps you understand how it's important to understand range of motion and then performance of muscle through that range and, and dealing with muscle imbalances that may occur. So I would encourage you to look at that case. But in any case, for us, you know, we're going to use our treatment-based classification scheme. So we're going to go ahead and do a good thorough assessment of these individuals, make sure we assess specifically the internal and external rotators of the hip, and determine are we dealing with weakness there at all. When you start to look at altered angles in the transverse plane, when we start talking about angles of version at the hip, it really changes the function of the internal and external rotator. So they're no longer in that optimal length tension relationship. So it's not uncommon to see weakness in either one or potentially even both. And we have to address those, right? We know we're going to have uh, variances with respect to mobility. We're going to see if it's an antiverted hip, we're going to see a great deal of internal rotation. And we need to make sure that that internal rotation is controlled, right, during gait and functional activities. So strengthening neuromuscular education is going to be key. We also have orthotics up here as well, especially when you're dealing with folks who have an antiverted or a retroverted hip. It's not uncommon to see some concerns down at the foot. And so we do sometimes see orthotics as being helpful. Again, the case that we've given you uh, gives some example of that. The individual is having some knee pain associated with some of the activities and um, some orthotics were prescribed that definitely helped that particular case. We've posted this paper for you on the website, and I would recommend that you take some time to review it, be familiar with the principles that they used with respect to rehabilitation, and how the exercises really were used um, to optimize the outcome for this particular patient. So let's take a few minutes and talk about labral tears. This is a topic that has gained an awful lot of consideration in the last several years. And one of the biggest concerns with respect to labral pathology is the significance of it. What I mean by that is, is that if you take uh, scans of uh, hips of asymptomatic individuals, anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of folks are going to have labral tears. And so it's important for us to really determine how do we figure out if that labral tear is really playing into the patient's condition or not? And we're going to spend a little bit of time doing that. When we begin to think about labral tears, they can really happen in one of two ways. First off, we can get the sudden onset of symptoms after a, an injury or trauma to the hip. The second way is we can get gradual development of symptoms, and we see that with progressive degeneration of the labrum. And if you begin to look at uh, individuals who have hip osteoarthritis who are a little bit older, and you begin to do MRI scans of their hip, you're going to note that a significant portion of them will have degenerative labral tears. However, they're not necessarily uh, a player in their condition. These are labral tears that have occurred slowly over time, and it really is essentially their new normal. It's part of that degenerative cascade that we see. And so anytime you do see labral tears on imaging, again, the question is, how do they fit into the patient's overall clinical picture, and are they a symptom generator or not? The primary reason is that 
If they don't get better conservative measures and the labor is thought to be a symptom generator, they're going to go on to have surgery. And sometimes we see patients after labral repair surgery and they're no better, primarily because it was not a symptom generator. And so there's a lot of caution with that. Nonetheless, what are some of the common symptoms that we see in individuals who have labral pathology? First and foremost, if they have labral pathology, it's likely they're going to have pain located in the groin or anterior hip region. They may have locking or clicking at the hip joint. They're going to have stiffness in the hip, especially after periods of prolonged sitting, and they're going to have limited range of motion, especially when we move the hip into combined movements of flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. So that symptom profile should help you a little bit and helping determine if a patient has a labral tear on a scan or if you have a high index of suspicion with, of a labral tear in your history and your clinical exam. These are some factors that can lead you toward that. An additional way to know if the symptoms are related to labrum or not is to have an intraarticular injection. In this particular case, we're dealing with magnetic resonance arthrograms, which are the gold standards for determining if the labrum is torn or not. And in this particular case, uh, we're going to see an intraarticular injection into the hip with a contrast medium called gadolinium. That's going to show up nice and bright on these MRI scans. And we'll also use an anesthetic like Marcane, which is injected into the hip. And if the individual has true intraarticular pathology related to the labrum, after we give them that anesthetic injection into the hip, their exam is going to markedly improve. However, if their symptoms are more extraarticular, even after we give them that injection into the hip, we won't see an improvement into their symptoms. And this shows you a labral tear on three consecutive scans of the same uh, MR arthrogram, separated by maybe two or three millimeters apart, which speaks to the fact that the uh, labral tear in this individual is rather extensive. And so when we look at labral pathology, we want to know, number one, how is it interfering with function and how extensive is it? And in this particular case, uh, we determine that it is rather extensive based upon the MR arthrogram that we see with our patient. One clinical condition that we know that can lead to labral tears is called femoral acetabular impingement. And all this relates to is decreased joint clearance between the femur and the acetabulum. And so when we talk about femoral, ac femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, it really leads to abnormal contact between the femur and the acetabulum, particularly, particularly when we're dealing with positions of hip flexion, adduction, internal rotation. And FAI can lead to labral tears, as well as progressive degeneration of the joint, especially uh, like we may see with osteoarthritis. So these particular images here show us the different types of femoral acetabular impingement. In the upper left-hand column, we see a normal hip. That would almost be like an axial view. We're looking down at the hip from the top. You can see the femoral head as well as the acetabulum and the labrum. Um, on the right of that upper right-hand corner, we call that cam impingement. We're dealing with altered morphology at the femoral head neck junction. You can see that. Bottom left-hand corner, we're dealing with pincer FAI. That means that we have altered morphology at, at the acetabulum, and we can also have mixed, meaning that we have both cam and pincer. We have altered morphology at the femoral head and neck junction, as well as the acetabulum. Again, this FAI can lead to labral tears, as well as premature uh, osteoarthritis in individuals. The two images on the bottom we see again on the left is cam impingement, which is the result, again, of abnormal, mor abnormal morphology of the proximal femur at the femoral head and neck junction. And on the right of that is the pincer impingement, which is the result of the abnormal morphology orientation of the acetabulum. And these combined or in isolation can lead to altered mechanics at the hip, again, could potentially influence the labrum and potentially uh, promote early wear and tear of the joint. This particular slide shows examples of both cam uh, femoral acetabular impingement as well as the mixed 
uh, femoral acetabular impingement. So on the left, the x-ray image you see there, you can see some alterations in the uh, morphology of the femoral head and neck junction. And then on the right, the x-ray image on the top of the screen there shows both pincer as well as cam impingement. Uh, both on that particular image, you can see altered morphology of the acetabulum as well as altered morphology of the femoral head and neck junction. And then the image on the bottom right there uh, shows a physical therapist moving a patient's hip into that flexed, adducted, internally rotated position, which really allows uh, you to compress those soft tissues. And if the patient has pain with that, it's oftentimes consistent with femoral acetabulum impingement, as well as potentially a labral tear, especially if there's clicking, popping, or catching associated with that movement. And that flexed adducted internal rotated position is something you should be familiar with because we saw that with respect to our scour position. When we scoured the hip, we started in that flexed adducted internally rotated position, very similar to this position we see here. And so when we begin to think about basic rehabilitation principles with individuals who have labral tears and femoral acetabular impingement, there's a couple considerations here. If we're dealing with an individual who has more acute onset of symptoms associated with an injury, we want to try and stage these folks out with respect to tissue healing, and we want to make sure that the first thing we try and do is really uh, control their pain and inflammation and really work on relieving their symptoms. This could be used through offloading, relative rest from activity, non-steroidals, and uh, potentially some modalities. We want to maintain function uh, while the individual is in those early stages of healing. And so we may want to have them hold off on higher impact cutting pivoting type activities, but certainly they can ride a stationary bike, they can exercise in a pool, anything we can do to help maintain function and cardiovascular status. And our management strategies, again, as these individuals move into the subacute or more chronic phases, are going to be after we've controlled inflammation and pain, let's look and see are we dealing with concerns over a loss of mobility, or are we dealing with concerns over a loss of strength and, and potential concerns with neuromuscular re-education. And so we may have to employ some joint mobilizations. Um, range of motion activities, be very, very careful with stretching as well, but that could be one activity that we could employ. And then, of course, working on muscle strength. We may want to consider limiting activities in the frontal and sagittal planes, especially early on in rehab, because these have a tendency to put a little bit more force on the labrum, as well as uh, uh, they could potentially exacerbate some of those impingement issues that we see with FAI. Certainly move up to the lumbar spine, ensure that we have adequate strength and stabilization there and mobility if necessary. And then once again, if we see labral pathology on diagnostic imaging, it appears to be uh, a factor in their clinical, clinical picture. We've seen an intraarticular injection with an arthrogram, and that arthrogram has demonstrated labral pathology, and we also note at least a 50% reduction in symptoms associated with that intraarticular injection. If they're not getting better with conservative measures, sometimes surgery is an option. And there are many different ways uh, to approach labral pathology, especially with much of the pathology that we see around the surrounding bony structures. We could see labral debridements, we could see labral repairs, we could also see different types of procedures with respect to the bone, where some of that bone is actually going to be removed. There could be articular cartilage lesions that are going to be dealt with, and there could be different procedures that are done to really optimize that bony anatomy around the hip joint while trying to spare as much of the labrum as possible. Those techniques vary among surgeons, and um, usually there's a protocol associated with that, and surgeons are very, very particular how these post-operative hips are usually managed. Most of this is done, the vast majority of this is done through arthroscopy, um, and so um, you know, they're minimally invasive procedures, but they can have a lot of work done inside the hip. And so I've included on the next page, uh, the first page of a, of a very extensive protocol to give you an example of one I posted on the Blackboard site. And when you get a chance, take a look at it. But if you're going to work with this population, um, 
after, after or in your clinicals or after you graduate. Um, Post-operative uh, hip care is extremely uh, important. It's very, very detailed, and, and it's important to have a close working relationship with the surgeon so that everyone's on the same page with respect to activity. On the Blackboard site, I did post a, a hip arthroscopy um, protocol. This is one orthopedic surgeon's uh, protocol, but I think it gives you some idea of the extent and the level of detail that's put into uh, these type of protocols. And so in the protocol on the Blackboard site, you'll see very extensive instructions with respect to goals for different phases of rehab, as well as very extensive instructions for the therapist and the patient and instructions in the exercises and different techniques that will be utilized during rehabilitation. The key is to ensure that everyone's on the same page. Um, the patient, the therapist, and the physician all have to be on the same page with respect to rehab, what the goals need to be, especially to progress from phase to phase. When we describe some of the symptoms that are associated with labral, labral tears, we mentioned that you could potentially have clicking or popping or catching inside the hip joint. One clinical condition that really looks at, you know, um, snapping of the hip is this condition called coxa sultans. And we have, when we talk about a snapping hip, it's really a, a popping or, or a clicking that occurs at the hip. We see causes that are either extra-articular or intra-articular. The intra-articular causes we'll talk about that are internal and external snapping. And then the intra-articular is actually due to labral pathology that we'll talk more about. We mentioned that one of the extra articular variants of coxus sultans is internal snapping. And that relates to two very, very specific structures. One, the iliopsoas as it passes over the lesser trochanter or the anterior acetabulum. And that's really the most common source of snapping we sometimes see at the hip. The second is the iliofemoral ligament. As it moves past the femoral head, we can get snapping there as well. And I'll mention this about all of the snapping that we potentially see. It, this could all be asymptomatic and infrequent in some individuals. And for whatever reason, it begins to become more symptomatic. Over time, if it happens more often, it could be due to a change in activity. But the bottom line here is with these internal snapping uh, conditions here, we typically see this as we extend the hip from a flexed posture. So if we start the hip in about 90 degrees and we extend that hip back, we begin to see at about maybe 45 degrees of hip flexion, we see individuals complaining about this snapping. It can either be from the iliopsoas or the iliofemoral ligament and will palpate it anteriorly. In terms of extra articular structures, again, we can also see external snapping. And this relates to either the IT band over the greater trochanter or the gluteus maximus over the greater trochanter as well. And so we're going we're to palpate these structures lateral. And we're going to note that during hip flexion and extension, especially if we have a little bit of internal rotation of the femur added in, we're going to be able to appreciate that snapping of the IT band, the gluteus maximus over the greater trochanter. And I didn't mention this with respect to the internal snapping, but certainly with respect to the external snapping, this could be due to irritation of the tendon or potentially the bursa. And so we're going to get that uh, irritation of the tendon or the bursa, and we're going to find it most, once again, laterally during hip flexion extension with some internal rotation. So internal external snapping, those are both extra articular causes. We do need to mention about intraarticular snapping, and that could be due to an anterior labral or an acetabular labral tear or potentially a loose body. Again, this is going to be individuals who are going to have hip, hip pain anteriorly in the groin and anterior thigh region. And that clicking and popping is going to be associated with pivoting motions. And these are individuals who are not going to have a history of asymptomatic infrequent snapping at their hip. It's typically going to be an injury or some other type of incident that led to a hip injury. And now they have this clicking or popping deep inside the hip, much different than internal or external snapping that we see with extra articular structures. As like I said, those are individuals who potentially have a history of infrequent uh, 
uh, asymptomatic snapping of their hip, but for some reason, whether it's activity um, or some type of change with respect to function, all of a sudden things are irritated a bit and we see pain associated with that. So be able to dichotomize between the intraarticular and extraarticular structures that could be involved because they're going to drive our rehab to some extent. With respect to management of individuals with a snapping hip, again, it's important to determine what the cause is. Are we dealing with anterior, more internal snapping concerns or external, uh, more lateral or external snapping concerns, or are we dealing with more intraarticular concerns? If it's the intraarticular concern, we're really going back to that labral, uh, the rehab that we talked about with respect to labral pathology, we're going to work on that. But if we're dealing with those more extraarticular, internal, external snapping issues, we begin to think about conservative management. Again, these are folks who could have asymptomatic infrequent snapping in their history. For some reason now, the snapping has become more symptomatic. And so we're going to start with that acute rehab principles, acute rehab principles relating to anti-inflammatory type medications, avoidance of these aggravating activities, potentially modalities if we need to um, potentially alter uh, the activities that an individual are in, especially if they're making things worse, get these folks into some lower impact activities that can maintain cardiovascular fitness as well as some function. We may need to consider stretching or potentially neuromuscular re-education or strengthening. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And if we're dealing with individuals where they're not getting better with conservative rehab, that snapping continues, it continues to be painful, it continues to limit their function, and we're really not able to make a tangible change in their condition, they may need to go on to surgery specifically to lengthen uh, some, of those, uh, some of those structures like the iliopsoas and NIT band to eliminate that strengthening or um, to, to eliminate the snapping and some of the irritation that's occurring around some of those structures mentioned before that it's important that we identify the cause of that snapping hip. And when we're dealing with these extra articular concerns, the internal or external snapping, if we're dealing with internal snapping, we want to make sure that we look at the length of the iliopsoas. If we're dealing with the external snapping, we want to make sure we look at the length of the TFL and the IT band complex. If those structures are tight, we want to go ahead and stretch those structures out. But there also has to be some understanding as to why did those structures get tight and, and why is why are we dealing with the snapping to begin with? So what's the underlying cause there? And in some cases it could be, at least with respect to the sagittal plane, if we note that the iliopsoas appears to be a little bit tight, we don't have enough hip extension, we have to ask, you know, do we do we have hip extension from the lumbar spine as well? And that could also play into some lumbar hypermobility issues. So this becomes multifaceted with respect to our rehab and then we have to ask as, as well you know when we look at um, hip and lower extremity weakness is there a muscle imbalance so it's it's not uncommon to have uh, weakness of the hip abductors or potentially the glutes or potentially um, or potentially the hip flexors associated with these conditions and so we want to make sure that we address those as well so as we're working on lengthening these particular structures do we have the available range of motion from the adjacent joints and and do we have appropriate strength and neuromuscular uh, control over these particular movements. So consider our treatment-based classification scheme when you're dealing with folks who have potentially a snapping hip and, and figure out where they fit and then proceed from there. After discussing the role of the bursa in conditions like snapping hip or coxa sultans, it's important to just talk about bursitis as an isolated condition because this is something that we could potentially see in many of our patients. And there are several bursa in the hip. Um, we're just mentioning three on this particular slide, but there are really several bursts. Remember, the role of the bursa is really to provide um, ease of movement. We see these in between uh, musculotendinous structures and bony prominences to allow ease of movement and protection of the uh, tendon and to really minimize friction with respect to movement. So that's why where we begin to see tendons and ligaments um, over bony prominences, it's not uncommon to see a snapping hip and um, the um, bursa be involved as well. 
But in the particular case of a bursa just being uh, irritated or inflamed, um, again, these are individuals who may come to us who haven't really had any uh, appreciable hip pain, and now all of a sudden they're coming to us with pain. Potentially, they're located in the anterior, lateral, or posterior aspect of the hip. These are extra-articular uh, complaints. Again, extra-articular structures involved, and bursa should be in our, bursitis should be in our differential, especially if we look at individuals where there's some type of an overuse uh, phenomena associated with their symptoms. And so first and foremost, again, you've heard it before, but we'll say it again. We're going to address those acute symptoms. We're going to stage these folks out if they're in acute phases. We're going to certainly manage their pain. We're going to work on trying to decrease pain inflammation through modalities. Again, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs if necessary. Um, in some cases, we may have to, once again, minimize activity with respect to relative rest. And in some cases, you'll see uh, physicians go ahead and give these folks a corticosteroid injection as well to assist with trying to decrease the inflammation. Once we calm these folks down and they begin to move into that more of a subacute phase, we want to address the cause of this. And we'll talk more about this on the next slide, but I want you to make sure that you have time to review the Rob Roy Martin paper on the Blackboard site. It's listed under hip text two. They do a nice job in that paper of talking about bursitis and the role that that condition may potentially play with rehabilitation of patients with hip pain. The key really is to determine what the underlying source of that bursitis is. We may have to look at some flexibility or muscle imbalance type concerns and address those. And certainly structural alignment is going to be a problem. Are we dealing with potentially a leg length discrepancy? Are there some pelvic obliquities that we're concerned about? If we begin to look at that, are we dealing with issues related to retro or antiversion at the hip? If so, those are conditions that we're going to probably want to manage and, and ensure that we're optimizing the biomechanics of the hip joint for these individuals. I mentioned the importance of that Rob Roy Martin paper on the Blackboard site, Hip Text 2, that we posted previously for you, but I would take a careful look at that. And this is a table that came right from that right from that book that provides some general guidelines with respect to rehabilitation strategies for different types of conditions. You'll see FAI listed there. You'll see those concerns that we talked about with respect to hyper or hypermobility at the hip that we've talked about with the treatment-based classification scheme. You'll see some, uh, some guidelines for musculotendinous disorders. And then find it down there at the bottom, we talk about trochanteric bursitis and IT band syndrome. And we mentioned that you can certainly have bursitis in different areas of the hip. This specifically deals with a, typically a lateral hip complaint, lateral hip pain complaint. And we're dealing with the trochanteric bursitis and it usually goes along with IT band syndrome and that's a common common condition that goes along with that and so some of the management principles for that are going to be to lengthen the IT band if we can that's typically going to be tight we'll assess that with our OBRS test we'll, we'll see that that's tight so we want to make sure that we lengthen that and then we also want to be sure that we don't have any muscle imbalances so are the hip abductors strong enough right to really control those frontal plane movements and is that a concern sometimes at the hip as well we see frontal plane complaints uh, we see lateral hip pain complaints but it could be due to sometimes a loss again of hip extension we sometimes see that and so we sometimes have to address sagittal plane deficits as well as look as well as looking up to the lumbar spine and dealing with any hypomobility issues there as well because we can get extension from the lumbar spine extension from from the hip, but if we don't have extension, especially with running type activities, um, we can potentially see some rotary type or some frontal plane type compensatory uh, movements that can impinge upon and irritate that bursa. Again, lower extremity biomechanics are going to need to be addressed, and in those early phases, again, use modalities as necessary, educate the patient to avoid inciting activities to really control pain and inflammation. So if you're following us on Twitter, at DamonDPT, you would have seen this paper. I retweeted it from another individual, but this is a paper that was just published. Um, it looked at individuals who have trochanteric bursitis, and it compared them to age-matched 
uh, controls who did not have uh, that condition. And what they found are some findings that you know should really help inform some of your rehabilitation. They found significant, uh, significantly decreased physical and psychological health in the individuals with the trochanteric uh, bursitis. And you know we've talked about you know some of the physical findings that you're going to want to address with with respect to your physical exam, with respect to physical function. This particular study, we noted that. There are decreased, uh, decreased hip abductor and hip extensor strength, and they also had an inability to climb stairs as well as their, as well as their healthy colleagues. And so those are things that we can address. We've already talked about the importance of hip abductor strength, but the hip extensors are important, as well as helping somebody uh, be able to negotiate a flight of stairs in a in a reasonable period of time without pain. So those are things that we can address. Some findings in this particular study, though, that I think we've talked about before, but it's, it's, it's important to bring up again, is that these individuals also have general uh, lower general health status and they also have uh, depression and so higher rates of depression. And so the general health, you know, th this could be things like depression, I'm sorry, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, things like that. And those are things at some point in the rehab, uh, course of rehab that you're gonna discuss with the patient, ensure their management is on point and they're, they're dealing with those conditions in a very, very positive manner. But the depression, you know, is, is something that if, if a person's dealing with frank depression, they're not being managed for it, we need to ensure that they see the appropriate professional. Because when you start to look at these changes in general health, as well as these changes in uh, these changes in psychological function, they can really influence your outcome with respect to rehab. And so if you're dealing with individuals who have depression and it's not being managed properly, ensure that these folks get referred and ensure it's taken care of because that will definitely help optimize your outcome. We're talking a lot about primary hip pathology, but this case, this this paper really gives you uh, some really good insight as to all the other things that are sometimes going on with these patients that we sometimes have to deal with to really optimize outcomes. So at the end of the day, you know, being able to display empathy, being able to display compassion, authenticity, as well as having the knowledge of how to manage these general health issues, uh, depression issues, and we're good with the physical impairments, but those other issues are really key. We wanna make sure those are managed appropriately to once again, optimize outcome in these patients. It's important for us to discuss the, the two main pediatric pathologies that you may see um, in an outpatient orthopedic clinic. And the first is late calf perch disease, and then the second is a slip capital femoral epiphysis. And um, both are, are different in terms of pathoanatomy. And so late calf perch disease, this is gonna be AVN or osteonecrosis, whatever term that you would prefer um, of the pediatric uh, hip. And um, we typically uh, see this in uh, children ages, perhaps between four and 10. Uh, boys seem to be afflicted a little more commonly than, 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 than girls. But when you look at the severity of cases, it's interesting that young girls typically have more severe cases of AVN or late calf purse disease if they get the condition. It's relatively rare. We see it maybe in about one in every 10 to 12,000 kids. Um, but when it happens, you're gonna hear a story of usually uh, a younger uh, individual, again, between the ages of four and 10, who's involved in some type of activity, athletic activity, typically pretty active. And, and you may hear a story of potentially uh, there, was an, there was an injury or it's a slow progressive kind of an onset of, of these low grade symptoms that causes the child not to limp and not be able to participate. And that's just not normal. We don't hear that in, in this pediatric population where they start to have hip pain and they can no longer participate in activities. So the parents normally bring them into a pediatrician. Some scans are done and this gets usually picked up. Gold standard for, for picking this up is gonna be MRI. If it's advanced enough though, it may show up on plain films. Uh, radiographs may not pick it up early on, um, but in this particular case, this is a child that we're uh, dealing with right now who, who has the condition. And if you look at this AP of the pelvis, um, this is an AP of the pelvis, so where I have that dark arrow pointing, 
that's actually their left hip. And so this is an individual who had left hip pain, long, uh, long duration of, of, of a few months here, where he limped and had some problems with that. And if you look at that left hip compared to the right, there's a couple of key components that kind of jump out at you. First is the amount of bone density that you can see. And that decreased bone density that we see throughout the femoral neck and, and femoral proximal femoral shaft relates to someone who's been limping for a long period of time and haven't been loading that hip as they normally would. So we see decreased bone density associated with that. But if you look at the femoral head itself, you can notice a couple of interesting things. It's a little bit challenging to see, but if you notice that, look really, really close, you'll see that that femoral head where I have the area where I have the arrow is a little bit misshapen. We're starting to see some collapse at the femoral head at that particular point, and we see some fragmentation of the bone at that level as well. We also see some sclerosis in the femoral head where you see these patches of white intermixed with those patches of dark, and that those those uh, patches of sclerosis as well as that flattening of the femoral head. Those are classic signs of leg calf purse disease in a child. Same signs we would see with advanced AVN in an adult. Um, but but this, this shows you an image of a rather complex case of leg calf purse disease in a child. So if you think about that x-ray that we saw of the young child on the last slide, you'd say, well, what would the goals be for treatment here? Well, the goals from a pathoanatomic perspective are going to hopefully allow that hip to heal. We'd like to see reossification and remodeling of that femoral head. And so we'd like to see bone density increase. And again, we'd like to see remodeling of that femoral head to get back to that nice spherical shape that we see on the contralateral side. And so to do that, first off, we're going to decrease the weight bearing forces that are going through the hip. These are folks who are classically compression load intolerant. So we're going to diminish the weight bearing forces. We're going to likely get these folks on crutches for a period of time where they're going to be uh, maybe limited uh, with respect to weight bearing, partial weight bearing for a period of time. While they're doing that, we're going to want to maintain activity so we can get these folks in a pool. We can do some stationary cycling in the clinic. We can work on gentle active range of motion and muscle activation across the joint while they're in the midst of this rehab plan. And then occasionally uh, we have to prescribe uh, an orthosis for these individuals. Um, it's called a Scottish right orthosis. We'll show you pictures of that in a second. But we immobilize the, the femur in a position of relative abduction with slight internal rotation associated with it. And that really maximizes uh, contact of the femoral, of the femoral head. Um, with respect to the acetabulum, and it facilitates healing. And so we, we want to, again, um, think about some of those basic principles. These are folks who are going to come in. They're going to be in a great deal of pain. But the key here is really to protect that hip. Uh, any long-term AVN, we have major concerns with that, right? These are folks who could potentially have a total hip. Uh, if this really doesn't get better. But the good news is that they do improve. If we can minimize those weight-bearing forces, um, there's going to be an orthopedic involved is going to help with this, but we can minimize those weight bearing forces, keep these folks fit, uh, continue to work with gentle range of motion strengthening across the joint, and, and use the brace if necessary. Uh, the outcomes are normally pretty positive in these cases. So in the picture in the right uh, uh, upper corner of the slide, uh, much easier to, to pick up there when we look at a vascular necrosis of the femoral head in, in that picture versus the x-ray, but you can see a very, very advanced case of avascular necrosis there where that femoral head is certainly misshapen. And remember, the goal there is going to be to facilitate that blood flow back into the hip. We want to make sure that we facilitate that reossification and remodeling. And we do that through this combination of minimizing weight-bearing forces, but continuing to facilitate activity through the hip. And you may say that when we showed you that uh, plain film x-ray on the first slide for this particular um, for this particular condition, you'd say, well, you mentioned putting them in a pool or getting them doing some cycling. Is that really going to change bone mineral density? Um, not necessarily at first, but if we can do enough of that early on, hopefully facilitate uh, diminished weight bearing, and then get these folks back into a program where we can very, very cautiously progress them, we can begin to see.
reossification and hopefully remodeling of that femoral head. And there's a couple images there of the Scottish right orthosis. Again, that positions the hip in relative abduction with a little bit of internal rotation, and that just facilitates appropriate healing uh, of the femoral head. Once again, good outcomes with this if it's caught early and managed appropriately. Uh, these, these patients usually do pretty well long term. The other pediatric hip condition that likely deserves some discussion here is slip capital femoral epiphysis. And this clinical picture is a little bit different than we see for the leg calf purse disease. So with respect to slip capital, capital femoral epiphysis, um, we do know some of the risk factors here. Um, with respect to leg calf, leg calf purse disease, that's an idiopathic disorder. We're not really sure of the causes or why a particular child has that condition. But with respect to slip capital femoral epiphysis, we sometimes see this in individuals who are a little bit heavier with respect to body mass, um, folks who have a history, a family history of uh, uh, skiffies or a slip capital femoral epiphysis. We sometimes call it a skiffy for short, which is kind of a, a, a neat, neat little acronym for it. And uh, individuals could potentially have endocrine disorders, so they may have some thyroid dysfunction, and that potentially can lead to this as well. Uh, nonetheless, it's a condition that uh, these are kids who are going to have. Sometimes we see it, I'll show you a slide in a second, of a patient that we're dealing with. They have an inciting incident, so they have an injury or trauma to their hip, and they note that their hip feels like it kind of gave way. These individuals are typically a little bit older, uh, so boys, we typically see it more common in, again, uh, between the ages of 12 and 16, um, and, and girls between young girls between the ages of maybe 10 and 14. And it can be associated with a growth spurt. And so you may hear that they sprouted up an inch or two or a couple of inches over the course of the past summer. And then they had this injury to their hip. And this should be first and foremost in your diagnostic uh, workup. So how would we work this up? Plain film radiographs are going to be perfectly fine to pick this up, and it normally gets picked up on that pretty easily. But these are kids who are going to talk about having hip pain. Uh, they're not going to be able to participate in athletics. They're likely going to have a limp. And so these are folks we want to make sure we work this up. The main concern here, if it doesn't get picked up early, is avascular necrosis, right? You can think about that growth plate. Um, there's blood flow that's across that into the femoral head from the femoral neck. And our main concern here is long-term uh, complications of AVN. And these are folks, if it doesn't get fixed properly, these are folks that we have to go on to typically see total hips in these folks at a very young age, which is a major concern. But you can see the diagram up there um, on the right-hand side, that femoral head kind of slips across the growth plate in relation to the uh, femoral neck and we can see that offset there again blood flow to the femoral head is a concern there so how is it managed it's going to be managed surgically and so on the bottom right there you see kind of the cartoon drawing but then the plain film radiograph usually a screw or two is passed up through the femoral neck into the femoral head to stabilize the femoral head on the femoral neck and so um, we see that surgical stabilization with respect to post-operative care. These are folks who are going to be uh, minimized, have minimized weight bearing for a period of time, maybe up to six weeks, um, where they're going to be either either partial weight bearing um, or weight bearing is tolerated with uh, an ambulance or with an assistive device for a period of time, but likely up to about six weeks. And then usually at that time, um, we're allowed to begin to do some range of motion, some strengthening activities, and try and work to maximize function. And we, uh, we also want to educate the individual so weight loss is going to be key. Uh, at least weight control, um, because the heavier these folks are, the more force is going through that. And then these are individuals who typically want to get back to high level sport activities. And there's debate on that, you know, as to what you'd want this individual to do. The risk here again would be AVN if we continue to see. Uh, this slippage occurring. Um, and so typically high impact cutting type activities, especially that involve contact, you'll see lots of orthopedic surgeons who say we'd like to growth plates fused first before we go back to that type of an activity. And so they can certainly get back to normal daily activity, going to school, maybe even participating a little bit of phys ed, um, but they may have some limitations with respect to high level sport. But nonetheless, 
you're going to see these folks post-operatively. Uh, they're going to have uh, a, a period of protected weight bearing, and then you can work with them a little bit, progress them along with respect to their range of motion, their strengthening, and trying to maximize function. And here's a patient that we've seen recently. Um, you can see this is an AP of the pelvis, and you're looking at um, the left hip where I have that white arrow placed. And you can see you know, the growth plate uh, where I have it, the growth plate. You see the femoral head slip down and in relative to that uh, femoral neck. And so there's a classic example of a, of a slip capital femoral epiphysis there. And you can kind of compare it to the opposite side where you see that normal uh, femoral head and femoral neck uh, complex there. Again, the main concern with this is going to be AVN long term. Um, even in this individual, you can even see some decreased bone mineral density on that uh, on that uh, left side here. And so these are folks who need to be surgically stabilized and then um, work with a PT after they get off that minimal weight bearing protocol to, to regain function in their hip. And so one other pediatric condition that deserves mention is hip dysplasia and hip dysplasia relates to a lack of acetabular overcoverage over the femoral head. And due to um, issues with development of the acetabulum, when we don't have that bony overcoverage, one of the main concerns would be hip dislocation associated with that. And so hip dysplasia is one of the most common abnormalities that we see in newborn infants. Um, it's tested uh, routinely at birth and then during the, uh, the first year of the child's life. Typically, we see anywhere between about 10 and 15 percent of individuals, if you look at uh, ultrasound, um, have some evidence of hip instability. Majority of these folks are going to be women. It's much more likely if there's a family history of it and if it's the firstborn child. And so all of that really combined uh, helps us understand why it's important to assess for it, uh, primarily because it can influence development, uh, gross motor development of the child. And we'll talk more about that on the upcoming slides. And so we mentioned there'll be a couple of tests that, that are done early on uh, at the time of birth and then through the child's first year of life. We'll talk about those in a moment. But some other signs that you may see in a child are that, uh, because you may not pick up on this, um, but you may see some legs. The legs may turn outward a little bit. You may notice there's some decreased range of motion associated uh, with the hips. And once again, the concern here is that we see delayed gross motor development, which is going to influence the child's ability to sit, crawl, and walk um, during those first years of life. If the child uh, begins to ambulate, we will see a limp uh, due to pain and stability. We'll see um, a lack of abduction range of motion associated with this. With respect to gait, we could see a Trendelenburg and there could also be a leg length uh, discrepancy as well. It's most commonly uh, evaluated through means of ultrasound early on, but plain film x-rays can also be very, very helpful. With respect to management of this particular disorder, um, within the first year up to 18 months, you'll see bracing, splinting, and harnessing that may be used uh, to hopefully help that hip develop uh, properly. If it's unsuccessful uh, with the conservative measures, these folks are going to go on to surgery. And we have a video that shows you um, some of the surgical techniques that are used, <clears throat> specifically uh, femoral and pelvic osteotomies. And the goal there is to really optimize the anatomy, sometimes reshaping the head of the femur and the acetabulum, but optimizing the anatomy and the biomechanics to limit uh, dislocation of the hip in these individuals. If we see these folks following surgery, um, we're certainly going to work on gait training. Uh, these are individuals who likely have had um, a, an, an altered gait. Uh, they're going to have muscle weakness. Uh, they could have range of motion discrepancies. As I mentioned before, hip abduction is one motion that's commonly limited in these folks. And you'll see hip abductor weakness. It's not uncommon to see in Trendelenburg in these folks. And so 
gait training, uh, range of motion strengthening exercises, and then assisting the child with developmental transitioning through activities like kneeling, sitting, crawling, walking, etc. Those are all going to be important. Because congenital hip dysplasia is one of the more common abnormalities that we see in children, it's going to be evaluated on each infant at the time of birth and then again uh, through their first year of life. The two tests that are primarily used clinically are called the Barlow and Orlani test. This video really provides some really, really good insight into those two particular tests and kind of show you what those are all about. So take a moment and, and, and watch the video and learn about these particular tests. The video also gives some, uh, some good information too regarding um, some of the other uh, findings associated with congenital hip dysplasia and dislocation. We mentioned that if conservative treatment with either bracing or harnessing um, don't work um, during the first 18 months, uh, normally uh, many patients go on to have surgery to correct the dysplasia at the hip. And this video shows you a pelvic and femoral osteotomy technique that is commonly done for children with uh, hip dysplasia and a history of congenital hip dislocations. So take a moment and review that and it'll give you some understanding as to how, um, as to how the uh, surgery really wants to uh, reshape uh, the, uh, the femur, uh, the acetabulum, and the, uh, the pelvis to alter the mechanics of the hip and hopefully allow this child to have a, a stable hip at this particular point. Let's take a moment and discuss a patient case. We mentioned previously that uh, hip dysplasia um, is something that we want to assess for in infants. Um, it's something that if it persists through adulthood, it can also lead to potential problems at the hip as well. Um, in this particular case, this is a gentleman who was seeing a physical therapist for a primary complaint of knee pain and will describe the case to you. So this is a publication from the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports Physical Therapy in their uh, musculoskeletal imaging series. So all of you have subscriptions to JOSPT during this particular year. And these are cases that are put out that show one, one page, 250, 300 words with a couple of images that primarily show how musculoskeletal imaging has, uh, is utilized to inform PT practice. So this particular patient was a 53-year-old individual who was referred to a physical therapist with a primary complaint of, of, um, of worsening uh, right knee pain. He had a history of ACL reconstruction uh, several years prior and no diagnostic imaging had been done to this point. He talks about his increase in pain, um, perhaps related to some exercises he was doing in the gym, and he had pain now with activities like tennis, golf, running, uh, and turning in bed, and then uh, donning and doffing his socks and his pants. Um, the key thing here is that he had a primary complaint of knee pain, right? And physical examination of his right knee, however, was completely benign. Um, so examination of his knee, completely normal with no reproduction of symptoms. We've told you guys this before that we want to make sure you go up and down. So we want to make sure we evaluate his ankle, make sure we evaluate his hip. In this particular case, when we, um, when, when, when they, evaluated his hip, um, they were able to recreate his, his knee pain, um, specifically these movements of hip flexion, uh, internal rotation and adduction, as well as hip distraction and compression reproduced his primary knee pain. And so the concern there is when you're up examining the hip, um, are you dealing with an intraarticular issue that is for some reason referring down into his knee? I'd mentioned to you previously in the, in the first lecture that we did that it's not uncommon for hip osteoarthritis to refer primarily out to the greater trochanter region, sometimes into the anterior thigh and then into the knee. And then lastly, actually, we see groin pain with that. And some of you have emailed me on that and asked me about that. And I think it's primarily due to the fact that as we begin to see changes with the hip, patients begin to compensate and they start to put structures, put stress on other structures like the uh, trochanteric bursa or the knee in this particular case.
And so because they weren't able to really find in this case, weren't able to really find any alleviating factors and they were concerned about an intraarticular concern with the hip referring down to his knee, he was referred to an orthopedic surgeon. And you send a patient to a surgeon, they're going to do some films and let's take a look at those next. Imaging for the hip is primarily going to involve two views on the on your um, left is an AP view of the right hip and then on your right is what we call a frog leg view of the right hip. The frog leg view has the patient essentially in that figure four or the Faber's position where the hip is flexed, abducted and externally rotated. And I want you to just take a look at those films for a moment and see if anything kind of stands out to you. Remember, this is a patient with a primary complaint of right knee pain, but when we evaluated his hip and did some maneuvers at the hip, we were able to recreate his primary knee pain. But take a look at these and see if you, if you notice anything that kind of stands out, stands out for you. So in reviewing the AP and the frog leg view, some of you may have noticed that there's a couple signs consistent with osteoarthritis. First, you can see decreased joint space. You can see subchondral sclerosis at the acetabulum, especially on that frog leg view. And there's some osteophyte formation, right? And take a moment and study these images with the figure legend, and you'll be able to look at that a bit more closely. The other uh, concern on this particular film was they went ahead and measured the acetabular angle, which really tells you whether or not you're dealing with under coverage of the acetabulum with respect to the femoral head. Under coverage would be consistent with developmental dysplasia at the hip, congenital dysplasia at the hip. And so in this particular case, this acetabular angle is formed from a horizontal line from the distal pelvic teardrop and a second line which extends up to the superior lateral margin of the acetabulum. And an increase in that angle, again, more than uh, 38 degrees is consistent with acetabular under coverage. And you'd say, well, why does that even matter? Remember, we've talked about anything that folks can do to try and maintain surface contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum. When you begin to minimize the amount of um, contact between the femoral head and the acetabulum, you begin to increase pressure uh, in these different weight-bearing spaces, which could be a concern. The other concern is this cat. Next, what's going to happen is we're going to see an MRI because when you begin to see congenital dysplasia, there's concern over labral pathology as well as some other issues with respect to the bone. So let's take a look at that next. The findings on the plain films in the last slide suggested that there was some acetabular under coverage based upon the acetabular angle. And so this particular image here, which is a coronal view MRI of both hips, likely the pelvis, both hips, um, really helps us delineate more if we're dealing with congenital hip dysplasia here. And so in this particular case, we're looking at what they call the angle of Weiberg. And the angle of Weiberg is formed by uh, drawing a vertical line from the center of the femoral head, then a second line from the center of the femoral head to the superior lateral edge of the acetabulum. Any measures less than 20 degrees are going to be indicative of hip dysplasia. And if you look at his contralateral left hip, you can see that that's 20 degrees. You can see the acetabulum, uh, and you can see how the acetabulum comes over and adequately covers the femoral head, and you don't see that on his painful right side. Right, you see an angle of six degrees there, which again is suggestive of acetabular under coverage and congenital hip dysplasia. The arrow, by the way, points out a subchondral cyst in this particular image, which we didn't necessarily see on the plain films, but if you recall, subchondral cyst on plain films is one of the findings, again, that's indicative of hip osteoarthritis on uh, plain films. So we already know that he has signs uh, consistent with hip osteoarthritis. 
Um, we know that he's dealing with acetabular under coverage, which is consistent with congenital hip dysplasia. And on this particular slide, we see a labral tear, and we also see um, bony edema. So the orange arrows in this particular case are showing subchondral reactive bone changes. Those white marks are what they're trying to point out, those areas of increased signal on this particular image, and that's, that, that's bony edema. And so all that means is that the articular cartilage is likely diminished. We have increased pressure over that weight-bearing area of the femur, and we're going to see over time bone formation or bony edema occurring just because that bone is being compressed in that specific area. So bony edema is consistent with, again, uh, more advanced change at the hip, as well as labral pathology, acetabular under coverage, as well as uh, hip osteoarthritis. So this is a rather complicated case. Um, in his particular case, uh, he underwent a cortisone injection um, and a bout of physical therapy, but he didn't really improve. He got temporary relief, but really didn't improve. And then nine months later, as the case describes, he underwent a total hip and all of his symptoms essentially subsided, uh, including his knee pain. And so this is a, a complicated case uh, from a diagnostic imaging perspective, but know that uh, diagnostic imaging is indeed important in managing some of your patients. In this particular case, this is an individual who had primary hip pathology that had referred to the knee. I know several of you had asked me about that. But in this particular case, he had a whole bunch of different things really happening at the hip, and all of that combined really did not uh, allow him to have an optimal outcome, especially with the activities that he wanted to participate in. Certainly, we have to spend a little bit of time talking about fractures at the hip. During our first lecture for the hip, we talked about uh, some of the tests that could be done to screen for low uh, bone mineral density. Um, we talked about DEXA scans that can be used to determine if individuals are osteopenic or osteoporotic and how that could potentially put them at risk for a fracture. And we talked about who those individuals may be who are at risk for a fracture, specifically, typically uh, older women, uh, especially women who are postmenopausal. And we've talked about this whole concept of if they've been taking corticosteroids for some reason. Corticosteroids can affect bone metabolism and certainly can affect bone mineral density. And so if we're dealing with older individuals, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a female necessarily, because even older men, we're going to see decreased bone mineral density. We've showed you several scans already of younger children when they haven't been weight bearing as they normally should, you can start to see bone mineral density uh, decrease. And so it's not uncommon for older individuals, especially folks who are a little less active, to have bone mineral density concerns. But nonetheless, um, you can have fractures at the femur. They're very, very common, uh, especially in older individuals. One of the more common uh, disorders that we see, unfortunately, in individuals, uh, especially due to falls. And so in the graphic in the upper right-hand corner, we see fractures at a couple different points in the femur. Um, the one I think that's most concerning is that transcervical subcapital fracture. Why? Because if you look at where that fracture is located, you're likely going to interrupt blood flow to the femoral head. And so the concern there with that type of fracture would be AVN uh, or osteonecrosis long term. And so if that type of fracture is seen, especially in an older individual who already has uh, diminished bone mineral density, you're likely going to see a total hip uh, as, a, as a treatment of choice for that type of a fracture. Certainly those fractures that are at the intertrochanteric or subtrochanteric region, uh, those are going to be those are going to be surgically repaired with uh, hardware. Um, that transcervical subcapital fracture, if we see that in a younger individual, we sometimes see uh, femoral neck stress fractures in that region uh, and younger individuals, those will be surgically stabilized uh, with, with the hopes that we can preserve the blood flow to the femoral head and we can avoid long-term complications of AVN. But certainly if you're dealing with an older individual uh, with fractures in that transcervical subcapital region, it will likely result in a total hip. Um, this slide in this particular uh, area of the talk, we're talking about fractures. We've already talked about total hip, 
total hip rehab. Uh, the bottom line here is that with any type of fracture that we're dealing with surgical repair, uh, we always want to talk to the surgeon to determine are there any weight-bearing restrictions. And if there are, we want to follow those and make sure that we give the individual the appropriate assistive device uh, to manage that, uh, to manage their gait. Um, when it's time, and you'll know this in speaking to the surgeon, they'll look for some, some signs of healing on radiographs. We can then begin to work on gentle uh, progressive range of motion programs and begin to work on muscle strength as well as the person begins to transition you know, from these phases of protected weight bearing to whether or not weight bearing is tolerated and potentially uh, at the point where they could potentially, uh, we, can, we can get rid of that assistive device. And so we wanna make sure that they have adequate range of motion and they have appropriate strength. Certainly in older individuals, you know, these hip fractures are commonly associated with falls, and there's always a concern with respect to balance with these individuals. And so this is where that tug test, that timed up and go test, I think is important. You know, once these folks are back to the point where they can start to function at a higher level, do a nice timed up and go test, look at a few other measures of balance and determine if this, this person's at risk for falling. If they are, make sure that you employ appropriate balance training measures into your program, right? And we'll talk more about that right, when we get together and talk about how we can address proprioceptive deficits and some balance deficits in some older individuals. But that's extremely important to manage, especially if their fracture was associated with the fall, right? Assess balance and address those deficits it's appropriately. We mentioned before that patients who have fractures in that transcervical or subcapital region can potentially uh, progress on to developing AVN. So it's a nice time to kind of segue into that particular disorder. And I know you'll speak uh, to this in other classes about uh, AVN and some of the clinical presentations of it, but this is a patient that we had seen recently, um, a woman in her mid-20s um, who was um, taking uh, long-term corticosteroid usage for uh, asthma and um, developed hip pain primarily on the right side. And so on the left side of the image there, you see an AP of the pelvis, and then on the right side, you see the corresponding magnetic resonance imaging. And so if you look at the uh, image on the right side, and, and these were done because she wasn't getting better with therapy, right? So she came to therapy. She actually had lateral hip pain that was thought to be related to trochanteric bursitis, potentially, and maybe some IT band syndrome. Uh, type complaints, but she wasn't getting better, and the therapist went ahead and recommended some films. And once again, the image on the left is the plain film, and I think a couple things kind of jump out at you there. I got a red arrow there kind of pointing out, uh, you know, the area of the femoral head, but if you compare that femoral head uh, on the right compared to the left, where I have the red arrow, you can appreciate that that femoral head is just flattened a little bit and a little bit misshapen. There's also a little bit more sclerosis, meaning a little bit more white and patchy areas in that femoral head, and that's very consistent with uh, concerns for AVN. And if we move over to the uh, MRI image, um, you can see that that femoral head on the uh, on the uh, right again is uh, you look at that area of the femoral head it should be nice and bright and and well shaped but we can see that there's fragmentation and collapse of the femoral head there and you can see where I have the red arrow that darkness on the MRI scan shows you that uh, that area much better. Uh, with respect to the femoral head. Even on the contralateral side, there's early AVN there. You can look at that femoral head, and that femoral head should be nice and round on MRI, and it's not. And so this is a woman who has bilateral AVN, uh, more so on the right than the left. Um, and, and the thought here was it's from long-term corticosteroid usage from uh, her asthma. This particular case, I believe highlights the importance of diagnostic imaging for physical therapists and really when physical therapists should work with physicians in obtaining the appropriate uh, diagnostic imaging uh, sequences for their patients. In this particular case, this patient went on to undergo uh, 
uh, right total hip arthroplasty given the degree of uh, AVN at her right hip. And she continues to be monitored um, for symptoms on the left side. Um, if we look at the MRI report and the imaging reports are below, the formal imaging reports that you see from the radiologist, but if we look at those imaging reports, there is early indication of avascular necrosis on the left hip as well. If you look at the plain film, uh, there's no indication of that. And it really speaks to how much more information we can get from magnetic resonance image and that we can get from plain film radiography. So again, underwent total hip arthroplasty on the right side. She'll continue to be monitored for symptoms on the left. And we're going to talk about risk factors uh, for AVN here in a second. But uh, the systemic use of corticosteroids is, is one of those in which this patient had um, as a, as a child and as a adolescent and teenager growing up into young adulthood to manage her asthma. And so this slide discusses some of the traumatic and non-traumatic causes of avascular necrosis of the hip. And I think it's important to, to have some understanding of what these causes potentially are. Um, the way this typically is going to happen, you're going to have a patient who comes to you for hip pain and you're going to develop your differential and you're going to treat them. And like the patient in the last slide that we discussed, they're not going to improve. And so at some point, AVN has to be in the differential someplace because you're going to look for diagnostic imaging and you may potentially see that. And so on the left there, we, we list out the traumatic causes. We already talked about uh, femoral neck and, and uh, femoral head fractures and certainly transcervical subcapital fractures can lead to AVN but potentially a hip dislocation uh, could lead to AVN. And then we talked about slip capital femoral epiphysis as well. Uh, one of the long-term complications of that's going to be AVN. Then on the right is this long list of uh, non-traumatic causes. And right there at the top is corticosteroid usage. And so we know that's going to influence bone. Um, second on the list is going to be alcohol abuse. And so if you have patients that you're concerned about alcohol abuse and potentially corticosteroid use combined with that, and there's several other, several other uh, factors listed there um, that are that are risk factors and potential causes for AVN of the hip. And again, I think when you're trying to develop a differential, you're trying to, in your mind, paint this picture as to why the person may potentially have this particular condition that would need imaging. They're not getting better in the clinic. And I think that if you can uh, put together some risk factors that make sense to you, that could potentially put the patient at risk for that potential disorder, that helps uh, you in some ways sell uh, the physician as to why we would need diagnostic imaging for this particular patient. And so with respect to treatment for avascular necrosis, uh, this is going to be a surgical uh, approach to manage these particular symptoms. If the patient's older and their bone quality isn't all that great, uh, total hip arthroplasty will likely be the treatment of choice, but we could potentially see decompression where they just kind of go in with a drill and kind of decompress some of the bone there. There's a thought maybe there's some pressure issues with respect to limiting some of the uh, some of the bony cells that, that work on tissue healing. We could also see bone grafting. Regardless of that, um, the technique that's used, you want to make sure you're familiar with the uh, surgeon. Uh, and their protocol following surgery, because that's where you're going to see these folks. And again, we've heard this story before. We're going to manage the acute pain following surgery. Um, we're going to try and maximize function as much as possible. There could potentially be, again, some assistive device use involved for the first few weeks following surgery. But we're going to want to work on, when, the, when it's safe, uh, range of motion, uh, muscle performance. And the big key here is going to be education. We're going to want to make sure that the person understands some of the current limitations of their hip because we're looking to gain that blood flow back. Again, when we talked about reossification or remodeling of that femoral head, we're looking to spare that femoral head as long as possible. For the uh, patient that we talked about on the first slide for this particular pathology, she's undergoing uh, testing and different options for surgical repair of that hip. 
she's in her mid 20s so a total hip that's awfully soon for that and um, we're going to look at some other options potentially a core decompression or maybe some bone grafting uh, to facilitate that because once again she's in her mid 20s we want to hold off on a total hip but we're going to see her post-surgery and we're going to follow you know the same guidelines we talked about here to hopefully get her better and and, and maximize her function and spare her hip long term from having to undergo uh, arthroplasty so I figured we'd end this block by going over a case that we had done recently. This was a telehealth visit uh, for a 45-year-old uh, male who had a primary complaint of left hip pain. He had a fracture of his femur eight weeks prior that had required surgery. Um, we didn't have uh, any films on him at this particular time. He'd been in this country about a month. Um, his English was somewhat limited, and the center that he was currently staying at, there was a nurse that was available uh, to facilitate the, the telehealth visit. Um, when we uh, talked to him about his, his uh, hip pain, um, he complained about difficulty walking, and he did indeed have an antalgic gait. Um, he also uh, complained about an inability to sleep on his left side uh, due to pain. And when we asked him to disrobe and take a look at it, you can see the image that you see right there. And so there's some redness around that proximal lateral left th left thigh region. And when I asked the uh, patient to palpate that, and the nurse did as well, it was a hard, hard uh, feeling um, around, around that area. Um, it was also a bit warm and a little tender, tender to the touch. And so the concern here was uh, several different things. Number one, he just had surgery eight weeks prior. Um, he had um, surgery done overseas. And, and you always want to at least have some understanding of what type of surgery was done and some surgical hardware. And so the first step here would be uh, to make sure that this gets imaged um, and we, we can get an image and take a look at that. Um, in the interim, uh, because he was walking with a limp, we did give him a set of crutches. The nurse was able to instruct him on how to use that. So we got him a set of crutches and the main main key here is to get him an x-ray. I did mention, I didn't mention um, otherwise that um, his general health was still fine. Uh, he didn't have a temperature at this particular time and he had no complaints of feeling systemically unwell. It was just this bump that he had on the outside of his hip. And as you can see, it's kind of red and once again, kind of hard to the touch. And so let's take a look at the x-rays that, that they got later that day. And so I have uh, the image up of him kind of lying in that supine hook line position so you can see that area of the hip again. And then on the right, we have the AP view of his, uh, of his hip. And as you can see, I drew in there I uh, drew in with those red lines. Uh, this trans like, likely had a transcervical fracture along the, the distal aspect of the femoral neck. Um, and you, I drew those red, red arrows in there. You can still see the fracture line there. And it looks like the repair that was done was done through an intermedullary rod down through the femur and then two screws that went up through that rod to stabilize the, uh, to stabilize the femoral. Uh, neck and allow the fracture to heal and as you can see that one proximal screw it's, it's backed out backed out and it's now pressing into his skin so that was the that was a likely major concern um, with this particular case but a couple of key points here uh, number one, always make sure you expose the area for these patients who have hip pathology. We haven't really talked about that much, but you want to make sure that patients are appropriately draped. You want to make sure they understand exactly what you're doing. So you want to make sure you get consent. And if need be, uh, always offer these folks a chaperone, right? Always off offer these folks a chaperone because you are going to be gowning and draping um, to look at some areas that, that are um, you know, we want to maintain modesty in, in all regards, and we certainly wanted to do that for this gentleman as well. But the bottom line here is that proximal screw had backed out, and so we had to get him hooked up uh, with an orthopedic surgeon. So he was able to be evaluated by a surgeon a few days later, and in the interim, we kept him on crutches, uh, non-weight bearing. Uh, non-weight bearing on crutches. I didn't have any handle for the stability that 
of that fracture, especially with that, um, we only had that one screw still in there, and it looks like there is some healing there, um, but we still can see a fracture line, and so we don't want that to uh, to have any more damage there. And so you can see the image on the right, where they look like they put that screw back in, and then a stabilizing rod is placed in there as well. And as far as we know, the patient's been doing great so far. And so this was a nice a nice case that that shows a couple key points here. Number one, you always want to observe the area. Area. Uh, and number two, I think at least for um, these individuals who've had surgery, you always want to take a look at their imaging. Um, know what type of hardware has been placed in there, um, know some understanding of the surgical procedure, some of the weight bearing uh, restrictions that are that are put on the patient, and you always want to take a look at the fracture line as well and make sure that those look like they're healing. And you can use that use that with radiology reports as well. So hopefully this is an interesting case that uh, that uh, ends our hip block. Thank you.